this podcast, Dr. Amy Gershkoff talks about hacks of building an amazing data science team. So stay tuned. Today we have with us an amazing guest, uh, Dr. Amy Gershkoff. She is a consultant and advisor to various technology companies across the globe. She is the former chief data officer for Ancestry, the world's leading genealogy and consumer genomics company. Prior to joining Ancestry, she was chief data officer at Zynga. Previously, Amy built and led the customer analytics and insights team and led the global data science team at eBay. She has also served as chief data scientist at, for WPP, Data Alliance, where she worked across WPP's more than 350 operating companies worldwide to create integrated data technology solution. She has also, uh, she was also the head of media planning for Obama for America 2012. Uh, and where she was the architect of Obama's, Obama's advertising strategy and designed the campaigns analytics system and knowing the history, I that was a pretty successful move. <laughs> so thank you so much, um, uh, Amy, for coming to our show and agreeing to share your wisdom with our community. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Beautiful. So why don't we um, talk about your journey uh, from from the day you graduate to to a day maybe yesterday? How <laughs> what how are things? How are things progressed? Yeah. So um, my journey is, um, I think, a, a bit unique. Um, back when I went to graduate school, data science as a term hadn't been invented yet. Uh, and the idea that you might create this multidisciplinary degree where you're combining, uh, you know, data mining and computer science with econometric modeling and quantitative analysis uh, seemed like sort of a strange idea, I think, <laughs> to the university. Um, but uh, I was very fortunate that they uh, let me proceed with this experiment. And um, I had a very multidisciplinary dissertation. And uh, that really um, got me on my journey to thinking about um, data science and about a kind of multidisciplinary approach to thinking about problem solving. And one of the things that I've enjoyed um, in, in my career is as I've built and led teams is combining people with different backgrounds from different academic disciplines and seeing how much fun it is and how great the results are when you combine people um, who have really different backgrounds and, and academic training, you can produce much more interesting and creative and impactful results. Um, so since my uh, graduate days, I've worked in a variety of uh, analytics uh, and data science related roles. Um, I uh, worked in a market research firm uh, where I learned the importance of listening to the customer uh, themselves, not just the data about the customer, but really listening to what the customer says. Um, I even ran some focus groups and uh, did some text mining analysis there. Uh, and then I, I went on to run uh, CRM and uh, analytics at a direct marketing company. Uh, and from there, I had my own uh, ad tech startup. Um, and that was back in the days before ad tech was cool. <laughs> uh, um, some might argue that it, it never became cool, but um, uh, I, I think somewhere in there, uh, there was a moment where ad tech was cool. And uh, that was an amazing experience. Uh, today, there are so many people, um, mm -hmm. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's so many people here with startups doing amazing things, but um, back when I started uh, changing targets media, we were uh, a very new company and, and just trying to, to figure things out, um, but we were very successful and um, became profitable, which was a big deal, and uh, got real office space, which was a really big deal. <laughs> um, and uh, one of my uh, clients at that company um, was uh, David Axelrod, and uh, yeah. he, of course, close advisor to President Obama, and um, recommended that um, the Obama campaign talk to me about the real acts. And mm. that was an amazing opportunity for me. Uh, I was, of course, a big fan and supporter of President mm. Obama, but I never dreamed that I would get the opportunity to convert that support of the president into a 22 hour a day job <laughs> uh, to help reelect him. And so um, I uh, ended up, uh, packing up and moving to Chicago and uh, working directly for the campaign manager to run all the media planning and buying and analytics for the campaign. 
And uh, that was both a tremendous opportunity to help the president, but also a really interesting set of analytical engineering um, products and political challenges, um, kind of all in one. Uh, and um, so we had to really build from scratch, um, you know, in a very short amount of time, just a few months, an entire um, uh, in-house media agency operation, uh, which was a tremendous undertaking. And I had an amazing team, um, which I which I had to kind of build up quickly. And um, together we we built um, an amazing uh, an amazing system. And um, I, it's uh, a a uh, big part of the reason that the president was able to move resources around quickly uh, in the campaign to reach the most voters in the most effective way. Um, so from there, I went to WPP, which was also an amazing opportunity, or I helped a lot of corporations who were facing similar challenges to the Obama campaign, also um, dealing with the challenge of spending hundreds of millions of dollars and wanting every dollar spent efficiently and effectively, wanting to measure results in near real time. Um, for a company that's spending perhaps a billion dollars a year or more in marketing, um, the need to measure and get real-time feedback and be able to pivot and optimize is, is very um, dire for them because they're spending so much money. Uh, the stakes are high <laughs> and um, analytics really matters a lot. So I, mm. I helped a number of companies with their media strategy. And uh, from there I went to eBay. Um, where uh, I started the customer insights and analytics group, um, had the great privilege to um, you know, work with eBay on uh, uh, launching a number of really exciting data science initiatives there and uh, led the global data science team. And then from there I went to Zynga uh, where I was chief data officer and uh, at Zynga, in addition to my day job on the data side, I also oversaw our advertising business and um, got to um, undertake a number of fun initiatives to make advertising as fun as possible for the gamer. And uh, including, um, we launched uh, some gamified ads while I was there, which was a lot of fun uh, for the customer, and it, and it turned out really good for the business. Um, and, uh, and then finally, um, Chief Data Officer at Ancestry, amazing experience. Again, um, Ancestry is the world's largest consumer genomics company, and there's a lot of interest in that industry today, and so um, I was able to help them with a lot of big infrastructure initiatives and um, and customer initiatives that that really were were very impactful. Um, and so now I've been uh, last uh, few months consulting for and advising uh, companies around the globe who are dealing with challenges uh, like how to optimize their user acquisition, how to integrate data science into product development, um, and how to. Uh, really get the most out of their data, data science and analytics teams and lead kind of data driven transformation from within, which is not an easy problem for most organizations. So it's wow. been a fun journey so far. <laughs> we'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Fascinating. I think so when even um, I was, uh, uh, I, when, 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 I was, when I was looking at your profile to invite you for the, for the interview, I think one thing that was fascinating to me, I remember was you have worked on almost all the cutting edge companies uh, who are <laughs> defining the way we, like all of, all of these companies have hacked the way um, or, or the traditional course. So, they have to be some amazing data science practice. So I, I, so I thought, hey, I, I need to get you on board and, and thank you so much for coming on board on that. So one thing that I, I really like, and uh, uh, we want to talk about uh, and have your perspective on is um, Obama days. I, I, I'm involved with a bunch of local uh, campaigns um, and including one of, um, uh, one of the Hillary's uh, initiative as well. And the beauty uh, about about those sort of campaign is how quickly you need to put together a rock star team. So the assembly and disassembly of a team, it, like you you can't afford to have too much time on that. So I definitely want your perspective on what were your hacks uh, or 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 what were your sort of shortcuts to put together an an awesome team when you're working on something like uh, getting President Obama then elected. Um, so. If you can share some insights there, that would be really, really amazing. 
Yeah, in um, actually uh, in the Obama campaign, as well as um, eBay, Zynga, um, I was building teams either completely from scratch or mm. uh, needing to hire a lot of people quite quickly. And it's definitely a challenge. You know, data scientists are in um, high demand, data engineers in high demand, analysts in high demand. Um, and uh, it, it can be a, a big challenge to uh, find good talent. Um, mm. There are a lot of people these days who call themselves a data scientist, but um, upon digging deeper, uh, not all of them might have the uh, best technical chops. Uh, and many people um, who do have the technical skills might not have the communication skills. Mm. They might not have the skills on teamwork and working together. Um, one of the things that I found is so important when you're hiring data scientists is an, an awareness of what you don't know. Uh, mm. Making sure that um, you know, you're not getting folks who all fancy themselves as knowing everything themselves because the field's too big. You can't, you can't know everything. And if you think mm. you do, you're probably not going to be the best team player. And so I'm always looking for people who want to collaborate and work together. So some of the shortcuts I found as far as um, building a team, obviously, um, you know, and doing so quickly with, with strong talent. Um, the first is I actually like to make a matrix where mm. I'm looking for um, kind of a balance across the team based on what I'm looking to accomplish. And so uh, that matrix would include um, a, te a technical component, but even within data science, am I looking for people who are stronger mm. on the statistics side or stronger on the computer science side, or are they stronger on the scale and productionalization of certain kinds of algorithms, which is really a little bit more on the engineering side? Mm. Um, are they someone who is um, you know, a really uh, skilled in more of the econometric area? There's all these different, um, pieces and components to data science as an industry. Um, and depending on the problems I'm going to be looking to solve over the next you know, one to three years, that would determine the composition of the team that I'm looking for. So the technical dimension is one. But then there are other dimensions, too. I'd be looking for a balance in terms of people's backgrounds. Um, generally, in a commercial setting or a campaign, you don't want all people who are fresh out of academia um, who might not have had commercial experience. Um, however, that said, a team of all people with, you know, five to 10 years of corporate experience might benefit from one or two academics being mm. in the mix. Um, similarly, uh, you might want folks to come from different industries. If you're trying to solve a problem in retail, you don't want all people who've only solved that problem before in retail because they're generally not going to bring fresh thinking to the table. One of the best teams that I put together for a project at eBay um, contains uh, one person who was a um, math mathematician as his profession and had been the, I think, chief mathematician for some country in Europe prior to joining my team at eBay. Um, one person who uh, was a computational biologist um, mm -hmm. whose research up until that point had involved, I think, butterflies um, mm -hmm. and some, something about butterflies. Um, so she definitely brought a, a very fresh perspective. Uh, there was a physicist from Eastern Europe um, who I'm, I'm not even sure I could do justice to describing the work he had done. Um, so you can see that's really like a diverse set of perspectives for solving a problem, an e-commerce problem at eBay. And so, um, so I'm looking for that kind of diversity as well. And then I'm also looking for um, a mix of introverts and extroverts. Mm. Um, data scientists as a group, we tend to be a bit more introverted. Um, but if everyone's so introverted, um, that they don't talk to one another. It's really hard to collaborate. So you need that good mix of introverts and extroverts. Um, and uh, you need a mix of, of people who maybe over-index on the communications side. Um, mm. I, again, as a group, data scientists don't always over-index there, but you need at least a couple of people who are capable of communicating to the business internally um, the, the results of the work and how to utilize it. And so really, I think about assembling a team as assembling, the, the way you would think about assembling a sports team. Hmm. Um, and uh, in, in baseball, you wouldn't want all, you, you can't have all pitchers, uh, but you need a few. Um, and you need some relievers, um, as, as the San Francisco Giants learned last season. <laughs> 
Um, and so you really got to you really got to have that good mix of people who, who can kind of play different roles. And so when I'm putting together a team, that's what I'm looking for. And so then as I make each hire, I'm looking at the team that I've already hired and thinking about uh, where the gaps are and where the biggest value add would be for someone with a particular skill set. And that helps me target the search to find the right folks rather than just um, looking for a, a smart data scientist. I'm looking for somebody who has a specific set of skills and that allows me to find a better match with the rest of the team. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Interesting, interesting. So I think, um, I mean, very well said. I, I think uh, I, I couldn't appreciate uh, more on being very candid insights about, about your team building uh, uh, dynamics. I think one thing that I find myself in flux with many of, many of, uh, of uh, in my past experiences, my perception of a team vis-a-vis of what I actually, when I actually see and experience it, it's it's very hey why like so if 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 you tell me hey put up a team i'll come up with sort of all the competencies that i need to build and start sketching it out and and start sort of checking it off but then when many times as i think you rightly said if if i see a a, a biologist or if i see a a a, 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 a computational um, physicist they bring such a fresh perspective that i couldn't have predicted for for that outcome and i was sometimes like i i even stopped trusting my instinct in if I can put together the theme uh, if, if I if it's, it was just on me how do you keep yourself in check in in those because when I think and this is um, I have seen in working with say very project-based uh, initiative like this team campaigns and all you have a lot of autonomy with you right so these guys are not very proficient about what data really means and what what it can work for and they're relying on pretty much your chops to to get them elected uh, such a critical objective uh, and such, such a sort of power bearing uh, position you have there. How do you keep yourself sane? So I think pretty much every data project that I've, data science mm. project that I've been involved in, um, I like to start with, um, instead of starting with the data or SQL queries or, um, you know, regressions or some sort of analysis in R, I like to start with um, the internal business stakeholder, um, mm-hmm. the team, and a whiteboard. Um, and I start with trying to think about how we would solve this problem conceptually. So mm-hmm. in a world where we had access to any data we wanted, and it was all free, so we have unlimited time, we have unlimited money. This, this is a fictitious world, but mm-hmm. it's a fun place to live for mm-hmm. the beginning of a project, right? Um, so in a world where um, money's no object, time's no object, on a conceptual level, what do we think is driving this consumer behavior? Hmm. Um, and I think that's where it's really important um, if you're working on a consumer product or you're helping a consumer company, you have to be a deep consumer of that product. I think it's very difficult um, to provide advice to a company or to build the best data science model for a company if you're not an avid consumer of what they sell, because they think going through that customer experience um, gives you different insight about how people make decisions. So at eBay, everyone on my team, if they had never bought or sold anything on eBay before, um, their first assignment was go mm. buy or sell something on eBay. If you need mm. something to sell, I will give you something to sell. I have a mm. no shortage of junk in my basement <laughs> that you can uh, put up for sale um, because they want you to have the experience mm. of being the And then that will allow you to sit down and brainstorm conceptually what you think goes through the customer's mind from your own perspective. And if you have a diverse team that's coming from maybe different um, academic backgrounds, different countries, um, different growing up experiences, um, and you have diversity on a number of dimensions, then people will bring their own perspective to that customer journey. And that will allow you to start with the concept of how you think customers are making a certain decision. And then what you can do is from there work backwards to say, okay, what data would do we need to solve this problem in a perfect world where we could get that data? What would it look like? Um, And then you gradually move into a, uh, a different world where you say, okay, well, we don't have unlimited time and money. 
and mm. we don't have all the data that we would like about certain things. So let's think about what the closest proxy is or the cheapest mm. proxy uh, for that particular variable. Let's start working backwards from, from um, our perfect utopian world where we have all this data to a less perfect world. And then it's only the last, you know, um, uh, you know, call it 20 or 30% of the project that's actually about getting the data and building the model. Because if you've started with the right concept, um, you're, you're much more likely to end up with the right model at the end. And so, and I think starting with the right concept enables people of all different perspectives to still work together really effectively because you've told them what it is you want them to solve. They've all had a common customer journey mm. themselves as a customer from their own first party perspective. And so then as a team, you could coalesce on a good plan of attack for how you're going to build that model. I think, so beautiful point. I think one thing that, that I can, I can uh, relate to. So I, I remember um, there's a company here, here in Boston, Kayak. And in, in its early days, the engineers used to pick up the customer service phones and, and respond, right? So the, the idea was if, if they understand the customer issues or customer pain, then uh, number one, it, it helps build empathy that what's going on and, and probably their product could solve it. And they're an engineer, they can probably fix it. And I think you are raising a beautiful point that in data science, we need, uh, we need sort of similar perspective of that we should get a hands-on experience of uh, the product uh, and I think I, I do appreciate that insight I, I think I've never heard about um, and in fact we should m hear more about uh, how uh, executives are uh, asking their team members to actually experience the product so they can build the empathy and sort of the vision that it requires to sort of sell uh, or, or deliver out uh, value to the customer and the company uh, so that's that's a, that's a very cool insight by the way I, I, I do appreciate you sharing that so let's talk about the very, very initial days uh, when you put up to a task, right? So um, building a data science team, what are some of the first five steps you would take uh, if, if you're gonna put up a, a, a rockstar data science practice? We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website, First Friday Fair, dot tao dot ai and find your next dream job let's get back to the podcast yeah so i think um, for companies that are at the beginning stages of data science transformation so maybe the ceo or a handful of executives have decided that they'd like to go down this journey of building up an internal data science team i think the most important first step that they can take which sounds a bit ironic <laughs> is to hire a really strong technical recruiter who specializes mm. in data science. And um, this sounds uh, like a bit of mm. an oddball idea because investing in HR is not something that most mm. companies are, um, uh, is a, not necessarily at the forefront of their mind. And mm. um, in, in talent acquisition specifically, um, often um, the recruiters are, you know, generalists, uh, maybe they didn't even come from a recruiting mm. background uh, perhaps they were a project manager previously uh, or something like that. And um, companies see um, uh, having low cost recruiters as a great way to save money. Mm. But it's actually a really great way to make sure mm. that you never get mm. the best talent mm. because the marketplace for data science talent in particular is so competitive, but same for engineers, good product managers, any sort of technical talent today is, is really widely sought after. Mm. And so, Investing in a recruiter with deep experience in technical recruiting, who knows how to answer the kinds of questions that will matter to a data scientist, and who knows how to converse at a basic level uh, with the candidate about what life as a data scientist at the company is like, can make an enormous difference. And so I'll give you an example. Um, one of the internal uh, recruiters that I worked with at Zynga um, was an absolute rock star recruiter, and she had come from a background where she used to be a, a Wall Street quant. So yeah. um, talk about knowing analytics. She right. knew her analytics. She knew data. And so when she would talk to candidates on my behalf, um, you know, for folks that I wanted to hire onto my team, she could tell them things like how many petabytes of data we had and whether or not we were in AWS for our data instance and 
um, what are some of the kinds of machine learning models that they might be working on and how the data science team interacts with data engineering. These are all exactly the spot on kinds of questions that a data scientist or an analyst is gonna have if they're smart and if they're good um, for taking the job. And so the quality of the candidates that I got that had been through her process were a vastly higher quality than those from any other recruiter I've worked with. Um, and that's because she herself had that technical background. Um, and, uh, and, and so I think that hiring the right recruiter not only makes a big difference with the quality of the talent that you get, but it also makes a difference in terms of saving the hiring manager quite a bit of time. Because obviously I'm getting much higher ratio of candidates I'm hiring, mm. to candidates I'm interviewing, um, when I have someone like that who can screen candidates for me so well. Um, so I think hiring the right recruiter is the right first step. And then the right next step is hiring the right leader for the data science team. And for that, um, it's really important for an organization to actually think very thoughtfully about what they want the data science team to achieve. Uh, because many organizations actually want a data science leader who is an executive with a little bit of data chops, a little bit mm. of technical chops who can sort of talk the talk about how data could fit into the organization and evangelize for data within the organization, but they're actually less concerned about um, whether the person has deep technical talent. Mm. Um, on the other hand, sometimes organizations say, you know, we have um, plenty of evangelists, we're looking for someone with deep technical skills who can actually roll up their sleeves and build some of these models. Those are generally different people. Um, there are some people who have both, um, but, um, it can be really um, challenging to find those candidates. And if it's an organization, what you're looking for is that internal evangelist. And what you do is you hire a rock star technical expert, then sometimes the organization is disappointed uh, because there was a mismatch between what they actually needed that leader to do and the person that they hired. Uh, and so I think it's really important to think about what are the KPIs for the team? What are the KPIs for this leader? What are the skills we really need as a leadership team, this leader to bring to the table? Where is data science gonna be situated within the organization? Is it gonna be part of the CTO's organization? And then maybe the CTO can play that role? Um, or is it part of the CEO or COO's organization? In which case the, the data leader really does need to have some of those executive communication skills. Those are all really different people. And so if you are clear about what it is you're looking for, you hire the right leader for that role, and you've got the right recruiter to partner with them on that journey, um, that's gonna mean that together that recruiter and that leader can hire the right team. But it's about that alignment up front and getting those two leaders uh, to be the right folks. And I think having the right recruiting partner is as important mm. as having um, the right leader for the team because with the wrong recruiting partner, uh, you won't be able mm. to hire a team of top talent individuals. It's, I, I think, I mean, fascinating, fascinating point. Fascinating point. So one so, thing that, um, from a personal experience, by the way, so we, I represent, so I, we help companies with, with recruiting uh, and 80% of our staff is data scientists. So I think your the, the very element of, uh, like if someone from quant background recruiting for you, they, they'll know the business problem right there and then, right? So, and, and interestingly, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll take you on this, uh, I'll definitely want your perspective on this. So we meet two, two kind of, uh, interactions. Um, so one interaction is, hey, we are looking for data scientists. Uh, we're looking for this mythical magical roles uh, for this this mythical magical evolution that we are we, we are walking towards. And we don't. Our recruiters are not proficient enough. Like, can you just at least help them understand what should they look for or whatever, right? At least, or you jump in and help us. And the the other side is, um, no, it's okay. Like. So whenever we go to those guys, no, 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 I think our recruiters are, are, are capable enough. So many of many of the interaction that we had, they are very ahead in the game. Then they realize, uh, okay, like uh, they know that they need a, a subject matter expert to, to be looking for them. But most of these businesses, and, and I, I give them full credit, right? They're not supposed to be in this, this hiring, they don't know how the, the hiring thing works. They rely on their existing um, sort of recruiting workforce, and and I, I I tell them, hey, use your personal contacts for that matter, right? At least whatever you can do to till you get this thing figured out. What has been your experience? So, 
definitely you met a, a rock star in singa but what about other interaction where you are and, and and i totally agree with you that recruiter has a very critical role even for my own company i need exceptionally well recruiters because if i need to get good amazing talent pretty quickly otherwise i'll fail so how what are some of your hacks or some of your thoughts there of if i don't have a very competent recruiter what should i do yeah it's a great question so i think if you don't have the right internal talent and you have the option to hire externally um think about hiring someone with some analytics background and converting them to be a recruiter rather than taking a recruiter and who has a lot of background in recruiting and try to convert them into a technical recruiter because uh the the latter can be much more challenging if it's absolutely not an option to hire externally and you um have to do the best you can with the team you've got um one uh a couple of strategies that i found that work well is if a recruiter is assigned to your team or to maybe a number of teams within the company that includes yours have the recruiter come sit with your team one or two days mm. a week have them be um around your team listening to the hallway conversations listening to the I call them coffee pot conversations. <laughs> I don't know mm. if anyone uses the water cooler anymore, but <laughs> everywhere I've worked, we drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> so have them come listen to the coffee conversation. Um, uh, listen to the spontaneous conversations where two people will um, start talking about an idea and jump in a room to use a whiteboard and and sort of start mapping out an idea for a model or a project. Because just being around those type of conversations. can help make the recruiter a bit more fluent in the language and give them a better feel for the energy of the team and what types of things the team is working on in a um another option would be um if the recruiter was was willing <laughs> and mm. interested um uh, would be to have them attend a data science boot camp mm. or um an analytics boot camp there's um a number of online courses that are a great option for um uh not just for recruiters but for anyone a, a product manager engineer anyone who's looking to become a little more fluent in data science there's some great options out there now um that allow people to do that in a way that's very um affordable and um you know doesn't take up too much time and so uh, that could be another option for getting them a little more fluent in in the field of data science but but i think these days what's so interesting to me is so many companies talk about how they're going to win in whatever their industry is. Mm. They're going to win on talent. Mm. But then they're not really following through with investing in an mm. HR team that's going to help them uh identify, recruit, um retain and develop that talent. And uh really if you're going to win on talent, it's not just about uh sourcing the right candidates or even mm. hiring the right candidates. It's also about caretaking their career development and their growth um and working on retaining them once they're there. And so um I am a big believer that HR departments need more investment in most most organizations. Interesting. Interesting. And and I think so uh, again very very uh, I do appreciate your perspective on this. One more critical area that I I found myself in one of the recent conversation very scary uh, at least to me. was that um, so this particular company uh, a fortune hit company uh, they were sort of optimizing their workforce right and and so data science is a new hot keyword they want to acquire a lot of data science talent pool and there was a neighboring um, i think marketing analytics firm um, or at least group that they want to sort of let go and and they were to invest in the in, in, in the other direction and there was a, a it sparked the conversation of oh no no let me i i won't repurpose my existing talent pool which are somewhat tangential to analytics that probably i could i could uh, empower and bring them over instead let me look at the nice next shiny object and probably get them from outside they'll bring in some outside perspective and and we are seeing lot of those conversation happening nowadays in which uh, the workforce sort of they already had, getting someone to be attuned to the culture is it takes forever right and then but the this but data science is the next shiny object that everyone is chasing after nowadays how would you what would you advise to those businesses like how would they should how should they think about um building an internal workforce vis-a-vis -vis getting outside and, and how, or maybe starting a balance 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, one of the things that um, I uh, did, I, I started at Zynga, um, I, think, I, I think kind of pioneered, it was a bit of a radical idea at the time. <laughs> Uh, but now I've learned a lot of other organizations have copied this idea, so I guess it wasn't so radical after all. Is <laughs> um, I started um, what I called uh, the Associate Data Science Transition Program, which is mm. uh, not a very creative sounding name. Uh, mm. But the basic idea um, actually was creative, which is um, to, we had a program where people from across the company could apply uh, to transition over 18 months um, to become an associate data scientist. Um, and they might, I was thinking of it as a program primarily for analysts um, to give them deeper technical training on the data science side, just as you've described, and enable them to convert to become data scientists. But mm -hmm. what was actually interesting, and uh, again, this is where investing in HR really matters. My mm -hmm. HR business partner was very supportive of career development and spent a lot of time working with me on developing this program. So I was really grateful for his partnership. Um, but what we did was we opened up the applications to the whole company. And we mm. thought that we might get, oh, I don't know, six or seven people who would apply, analysts who'd expressed interest, that sort of thing. Mm. And we actually were, were very surprised because we had 30 applications come in from all over the company, wow. and um, including engineers, a person from customer service, uh, a couple of product managers, and it turned out that there were a lot of people who were interested in making that career transition uh, to data science. And so then, of course, we had to develop some selection criteria because we had not imagined so much, <laughs> so much interest in the program. Um, and we ended up taking our first cohort uh, in and then doing a rolling admission every six months. And basically in the program, it's a combination of academic courses which you could take either um, online or here in the Bay Area, we are blessed to be situated near a whole bunch of really stellar universities between Berkeley, Stanford, uh, UC Santa Cruz actually has a very robust statistics program. Um, and there's, there's other universities in the area. So there's also um, opportunities for in-person courses as well. And there was a prescribed regimen of courses around uh, computer science, around statistical analysis, around um, data mining, uh, around data infrastructure and understanding what it takes to scale and deploy data science models, um, understanding uh, there was a module on big data. And the idea is that there's this series of six courses that you take. And, um, and, and at, the, at the time, you know, uh, we were also very fortunate that Zynga was providing um, some tuition assistance for, for those folks. I, I think they still do that. And so these per people would take these courses and then they were matched up with a um, data science um, you know, mentor who mm -hmm. would um, then enable them one day a week, they could devote one day a week up from their day job to their data science transition program. And that could either be used for the coursework or it could be used to work on a real world problem that we were trying to solve, a real world data science problem we were trying to solve at Zynga, where they would assist the senior data scientist who was kind of um, mentoring them on data science work. And so the idea was that they were getting a blend of academic training and real world on the job experience, but not on um, make pretend projects. These were real mm. live projects that we as a business needed to solve. That's pretty cool. And at the beginning of their program, the mentor would do most of the data science and the um, data scientists in training would mostly observe. But by the end of the program, the idea was that there'd be a transition where the uh, data scientists in training would do most of the work under the supervision of the data scientist. And this program proved really successful uh, for a few reasons. One is the one you mentioned um, in terms of employee retention. Mm -hmm. It was a huge advantage. There were a number of employees who said prior to that program, they were thinking of leaving to pursue other opportunities, and but because Zynga was enabling them to have this kind of development and career growth, they, they had decided to stay and they were really excited about um, you know, staying. And so it was a big retention tool, uh, but it was also great for us as a business to develop um, you know, new talent in data science who come from a background in other parts of the business, like product management, like engineering, because then when they're fully deployed on data science projects, they're gonna come with that knowledge from other parts of the business. So it again, mm. produces even better work. So um, the program um, was uh, just a win-win all the way mm. around uh, for employees, for the business, 
Um, for the data science team uh, to create a pipeline of uh, mm. new recruits, we're always looking to hire. And if you can hire a great internal candidate, that's always better. Um, and uh, I talk a little bit more about the program. I had a um, blog post in Katie Nuggets um, called mm. How to Grow Your Own Data Scientist. And so um, if you want more information about the program that we set up, um, that's there. And of course, always looking to hear about other organizations that implement it and any you know, feedback that folks have, but we found it really effective at Zynga. Interesting. So fascinating. I think I'm, I'm having a ball with this because I think you have some amazing hacks of, of how to. <laughs> uh, so let's let's talk about how to grow your data, like if how to grow your data scientists. So um, what are some of the ingredients or recipe or ingredients that that your best set data scientist uh, should or would have? Like if, if you can walk us through what are sort of, what are some of the qualities that you look for in your data scientist? Yeah, so if I'm hiring someone who's an individual contributor, data scientist, um, I'm you know definitely, as I mentioned, looking for you know technical acumen, but I'm also looking for the right technical acumen to fill out the team based on whatever it is that we need, um, whether it's more on the computer science side or more on the econometric and statistical side. Um, I'm definitely looking for strong communication skills, uh, the ability to explain what you've done, and the pluses and minuses of your approach. Um, and so I'm also looking for someone who's aware that any data science problem, um, there's pluses and minuses to any approach that you might deploy to solve it. Uh, the field's so big, there's so many different types of algorithms. Most data science problems don't have a right answer. And so mm. it's really it's really about um, selecting an approach to try and then being aware of the trade-offs of mm. the approach that you've tried. And so that's something that I, in a case study interview that I'm looking for people to talk through with me a little bit. Mm. And then I'm also looking for people who uh, take initiative and are not easily dissuaded by hard problems. So I often give case interviews where the problem gets harder and harder. What if you didn't have access to that data? What if that data was actually so many records that you actually can't use that type of algorithm that's a common algorithm and so on? Um, and so the problem will get harder and harder. And part of what I'm looking for is how they're going to solve a complex problem. But part of what mm. I'm looking for is folks who don't give up. And um, you'd be surprised how many people I interview um, and have interviewed for roles at various companies um, who the moment things get a little bit tough, mm. throw up their hands and say, oh, I don't mm. know. Mm. Um, or I guess I won't be able to solve that. And um, that's very um, distressing because most data science problems in the real world are really tough. And so I'm definitely looking for people with grit and determination who are going to look to find a solution and are aware that it might not be perfect, but they're going to give it a try. And, and not not quit <laughs> um, until the problem is solved at least a little bit. And so that's those are some of the things that I look for. Interesting. So now, now consider um, I'm someone outside uh, of your program. I, I have no access to your program. Uh, and I want, what would be my shortest stint to get to your, like you, uh, your data, the data scientist that you prefer? Like how would, what are some of the things that I could quickly build on? So that you could suggest. So I think these days there are a lot of really strong academic programs. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of boot camps and so forth as well, which, which are great. Um, but um, I really am a big believer in um, the in-person programs as well, because I think data science is hard and mm -hmm. trying to teach yourself is challenging. Uh, I know in graduate school, I benefited enormously from being able to mm. ask my econometrics professors a lot of questions mm. and spend time in their office hours and with other students and use the whiteboard together. Um, or actually, it was mostly chalkboard back in those days. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, I think there's a lot to be said for um, that kind of in-person training. And there are a number of universities now that offer uh, two-year or 18-month or even one-year master's programs in data science. Um, that are really um, uh, quite thorough and complete. And so for students for whom that's an option uh, to go and get um, a master's in data science, um, I think they're really well served from having that deeper technical foundation that you can only get from having an in-person professor um, to talk with. But for those where that's not an option, um, doing a series of online courses, it, it's not going to be just one. I, I think often people think, oh, I took one online data science class mm. and now, now I'm a data scientist, but the field's so big mm. um, and it's helpful to have at least 
um, a passing understanding of all parts of the field and a deep understanding of at least one or two. And for that, um, generally, you're talking about four, five, six courses kind of at minimum. So your understanding a variety of facets of that field. Interesting, interesting. So um, um, beautiful. So now let's let's get to the leadership uh, for, for a moment. So if say if I'm a very easygoing gut based decision making leader, and suddenly I've been told there's something called data driven, and I don't know what that really means, I need to build a, um, but I know that companies who are having a good sort of uh, data driven dynamics is showing some good returns and good sort of very, very calculated growth. I want to get there. How should I start? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think some organizations start with hiring a bunch of data scientists and mm. figure that they'll figure out later what they're supposed to do. Mm. And that's not a great approach. Mm. Um, one, it's not great for the business because mm. if you're not very clear on what you want a team to achieve, they're just far less likely to achieve it. Uh, and <clears throat> secondly, uh, the other reason it's, it's uh, not good is because um, you as a business want to be really clear about what you're trying to achieve so you hire the right team to achieve that. And so <clears throat> what I often recommend to companies is really um, don't start with we want to be industry leading in, in ML or AI or mm. data science. Mm. Start with this is the business problem we're trying to solve <clears throat> because it is possible that to solve the business problem you actually want to solve, maybe you don't need a machine learning team. Maybe you need mm. two really good analysts. And um, usually a two really good analysts is cheaper than an army of machine learning data scientists. Um, and so uh, if, you, if you can get really specific about what you're looking to achieve, um, it will help you hire the right people in order to achieve that. And I think um, one of the things that companies often hire data scientists for is um, innovation, um, especially in products. Uh, but then um, in order to achieve that, it's really important to integrate the data science team into the product development process. Uh, but what I've seen many companies do is hire data scientists and kind of put them in a, a pod uh, you know, mm. by themselves. Um, and then they have a wonderful team of product managers and engineers who are sort of sitting separately and working on other things. And then they're sort of puzzled why these, these groups together didn't produce amazing results. But those groups weren't even sitting near one another. They weren't working together. The product managers weren't involved in the hiring process with the data scientists. Um, and so it's not surprising that those results weren't achieved. So for example, one of the um, kinds of tra transformation exercises um, that I went through uh, at Zynga was we involved the product managers in the hiring process for our data scientists. And that yeah. produced um, great results because it meant that the business was bought into data science being part of the product development process. Mm. Um, and it meant that you made sure that you have the right chemistry on that team as well. It's not just about the data science team in isolation. You've got to make sure that if you're planning for a data scientist to be embedded with a product team, that everyone gets along and, and that the team's going to work as a team. And so, um, really knitting those closer together um, is absolutely critical. You can't just hire uh, data scientists in isolation and hope that they're going to drive innovation all by themselves. It's got to be as part of a larger business initiative. Interesting. And uh, that's that's a great point. And I think one more thing that, that I definitely want your perspective on. So I think a couple of days back, I was looking at my past guest in this podcast. And if that's a testament to gender diversity i think it's it's very clear right so there are not too many women in the in uh, in the data science domain why and how we, how like how to fix that particular problem like if 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 i can have your perspective on that that would be really helpful i think it's a great question i think it would be terrific if we had more diversity across a number of dimensions in data science not only gender diversity uh more diversity in race and ethnicity um, I think it's also um, very key for us to have more diversity in age as well. Um, data science is a young field, um, but uh, most research shows that diverse teams on every dimension, including age, uh, diverse teams um, do produce better results. So that would be mm -hmm. good as well. Um, and, uh, and there's a variety of other dimensions uh, too, as we talked about different academic backgrounds and so on. Um, but I think um, diversity always starts um, with changing how we structure uh, education and opportunities for children, right? From a young age, um, you know, boys and girls, and uh, you know, in internalize a lot of different social cues 
and um, you know have access to different kinds of opportunity. And and so um, you know I think many of the challenges that we're uh, facing in technology in general with with um, you know gender balance, uh, many of them. The, the read of the data, the early read of the data is very promising. You now have mm. more women in college who are majoring in technical fields, and you have mm. more girls in high school who are taking STEM classes. And um, so I think the, the focus um, should be really on starting with kids and making sure that kids of every race, both genders, all um, walks of life have opportunity to participate in STEM fields. And if we open up those opportunities children, uh, then that will carry into the industry as they become adults. And so um, I think it's critically important and something I'm definitely, um, you know, very committed to helping with in any way that I can. Interesting. And I think so one thing that, that I have observed uh, from my experience, right? So whenever say, typically, the road to my data science practice is, hey, I have this this weird project who want to pitch in, right? And the first hand that probably got up, gets the gig somehow and i think later like after a while i realized that somehow a lot of guys hands goes up and they get the gig first and like i i, I never care to think no no let me maybe give it uh, instead of asking who will take it maybe let me pick something and that could solve that problem but uh, subconsciously it just i think that's something even i even i have started doing now is no no it's like you you so at least from that perspective, instead of asking, because I know some people are, as you, I think you pointed beautifully a while back, that you you keep a mix of uh, uh, sort of optimist and pessimist, and you keep a mix of uh, sort of very uh, outgoing and sort of very very shy folks, and, and keep that keep that mix going, because like outgoing will always take everything, um, and there, there's a starvation problem for for pessimist or for at least those guys. Um, so. That was that was like one of the things that uh, yeah, I saw pretty fair and square that probably hopefully I'll fix it. Yeah, absolutely. In general, introverts, regardless of gender or right, any other that's true. dimension, um, often um, are afforded fewer opportunities. Um, but mm -hmm. this is where I definitely think, um, you know, it's incumbent on the leader of the team uh, to make sure that you're giving, you know, um, broad access to opportunities across everybody, just as you described, uh, but also um, making a special point to ensure that everybody, regardless of their background, feels that they are capable of taking on that challenge, right? Because sometimes it's not just a matter of being a bit shy about raising your hand, it's about confidence that you could really take on the challenge um, and do a great job. And that's where everybody um, would benefit from, I think, more positive feedback and, and so forth. As it, you know, many companies have a culture of making sure they give negative feedback, but uh, Hmm. fewer have a culture of making sure that positive work is recognized hmm. and rewarded. And that's just as important, if not more so, uh, to inspire and confidence, especially with younger employees. That's, I think that's beautifully said. Um, and, and, and thank you so much for walking me on that. Now let's talk about bias. I think, and this is, um, again, that, this is something that I get paranoid a lot about, like being now playing with data and then businesses are in increasingly relying on data for decision making. And now they're relying on maybe you or me or like whoever in the industry for the decision making. Now, if I have a bias that will creep in into the process somehow. So how to keep how do you keep yourself bias free, if I may ask? I, I think it's very difficult for um, any individual to be 100 percent free of bias. But I also think that, um, you know, we're all a product of our skills and experience and background. And that's why the mm. diversity of a team matters so much. Because, mm. of course, we all have, you know, uh, opinions about things based on the experiences that we've had. But if you put together a diverse team, those opinions and experiences are all going to be uh, different in, in certain ways. And then the, the total product of all of those uh, skills and experiences and opinions will be a better outcome because it's mm. from a diverse set of perspectives. So I try to actually embrace the fact that everybody is coming from a different a different perspective and use that as a as a way to form really high functioning teams uh, that that bring that diversity together. That's pretty awesome. So um, how do you keep yourself updated 
if I, if I may ask, like, what all do you read? Uh, what all you read, and, and if you can share with us. Yeah, so I I think that's a really good question. Um, actually, um, you know, we we talked a little bit about um, you know the books in the data science field, and uh, it's really tough because the field is changing so quickly that almost by the time a book goes to print, it might be a little out of date already. <laughs> um, so I think it's a really challenging uh, field from that perspective to stay on that cutting edge. So um, I definitely read a lot of uh, you know blogs and uh, you know journals online and so forth. Um, Katie Nuggets is fabulous. Data mm. Science Central is fabulous. Um, I actually utilize a lot of the LinkedIn groups. Um, a mm. lot of the technical LinkedIn groups have uh, various conversations where people post articles that are of interest. Some are a little more obscure, so that's a great way to mm. stay up to speed. Uh, there's LinkedIn groups for data science and for AI, for machine learning, for technology executives. So that's another great way. Um, and I also like to blend that with a mix of articles about uh, business and leadership and uh, you know strategies for management and, and so forth. So I read a lot of Harvard Business Review. I uh, you know read, read a lot of uh, you know kind of business journal articles and, and so forth um, because I think that that dimension is also uh, just critically important. And so, and there's also a lot of um, great LinkedIn groups for that as well. So uh, I'm uh, I'm a big fan of kind of a lot of the online uh, approach to staying super current uh, mm. in a field that's changing so fast. That's pretty pretty awesome. Um, and um, with that, I mean, I think we are at the end of the conversation. Thank you so so much um, for sharing your insights with our community. I think. I was expecting a totally different conversation, by the way. So I was blown away with uh, the, the the amount of insights that this conversation had about uh, we have created in, in this in, the, in this conversation about team dynamics and and team sort of some of the hacks on putting together a team and how to educate someone. It you have some very clever ideas. I think I'm I'm, I'm blown away by that, and and I do sh I do appreciate your 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 candid uh, uh, feedback or conversation on on that. And as a parting thought, like we ask all of our uh, uh, speakers to give out a closing remark for our for, for our viewers and for our listeners. Uh, do you have you want to you want to sort of have a closing remark? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciated getting to be a, a guest and having the chance to talk with you. And I think um, you know series like this do a great job of evangelizing the importance of mm -hmm. data for organizations. So thank you so much. Um, you know, I guess. Um, my uh, closing closing thought would be um, that um, it's it would be great if all of the senior leaders in the field mm -hmm. of data science and analytics would really uh, look to mentor more um, and spend more time investing in the next generation that's coming up. It's so mm -hmm. important um, to mentor not only on uh, technical skills and things like that, but but almost more importantly, leadership management. Um, you know, the more that we could do, that will help also with, um, you know, increasing diversity in the field as well. Uh, the more we can do to mentor the next generation that's up and coming, I think that would be great. So um, that would be my, my ask of uh, the folks who are listening is, is find, a, find a mentee and, and teach mm. them the things you know. And if your experience is anything like mine, you'll end up learning more from them than they do from you. That's, that's very clever. Again, I, I mean, thank you so much. You're always welcome on the podcast. Love to have you back again, uh, sharing a couple of more insights. And thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Uh, I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick. Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick. I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here. Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it. that's it. And I go into the booth feeling nervous. Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless. Is the mic gone? I don't know how to work this. Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the side.